I'm going to switch over here to Jen Palka's slides um, and turn the microphone over to her. So give her a round of applause. Thanks, Jen. It's so nice to be here. I realized since Civic Hall opened, I have not, so I live in California, I grew up in New York. I haven't made a trip to New York that hasn't involved an event or meeting at Civic Hall that has been like completely amazing and like uh, reassuring of that the world is a great place. So thank you for everyone who makes Civic Hall so wonderful. I'm gonna uh, try to go through a lot of information really fast, so bear with me. Um, I'm gonna assume that many of you know a little bit about Code for America and not sort of do the full dog and pony show, but um, we're a nonprofit that wants to make government work for the people and by the people in the 21st century. That's us, by the way, we're the by the people. Um, we believe that government services can be so good they were previously unimaginable, as good or better than what we use at home or in our personal lives. We believe that government services can work first time, usually in real time, that we could set up government services that, uh, in weeks and have them run at a fraction of today's costs, and that government officials desperately need to be able to see if their policies are working in days or weeks, not decades, if you work in government, you probably have gotten those binders of data that are out, seriously outdated by the time you get them. And we believe if we do all these things, then the people in government who work on the front lines can focus their efforts on supporting the people who need the help the most. And you'll see that that has um, inf uh, informed a lot of what we're doing lately. So we have a, an amazing fellows program. Can you raise your hand if you're an ex or current fellow of Code for America? I know there's several of them in here. I think they're, okay, they're standing in the back and then they helped check you in today, the current fellows. And actually, while we're at it, um, if you participate in a Code for America Brigade or uh, NYC Beta, Beta NYC or anything like that, can you raise your hand? Several more of those, wonderful. So I'm gonna quickly give you an update on the um, fellowship projects that we're doing this year. We're working with six cities, including New York City, and we have 18 fellows. Um, we're working now in three focus areas. Uh, and the first is safety and justice. Nikki um, worked in this area with us last year. I'm not gonna talk about her project at the moment. Um, in Salt Lake County, Utah, we're using essentially text messaging and web communications to help individuals show up for court and treatment uh, to avoid re-arrest. So in 2014, we had a team of fellows in Atlanta who found out that there were about five hours of waiting in line to clear a basic traffic ticket. Uh, and so as Steve was mentioning, we might not have all that, all of us have that experience of having to choose between taking a day off of your job and clearing a traffic ticket. So we may not really understand why people so often end up not clearing those tickets and then ending up with a bench warrant for their arrest. So we just used web and SMS communications, there's a little thing on the, New York, on the Atlanta uh, traffic tickets that now says please text your citation number to this number and we'll help you actually clear that ticket either making an appointment for you helping you pay it online if you can we're essentially building on that work in Salt Lake to help people who are recently incarcerated make sure they show up for their court dates that they file the paperwork that they need to do and try to reduce the number of people who uh, recidivate in Seattle, we're helping divert the mentally ill uh, and homeless population from the criminal justice system. There is no reason why if a police officer in Seattle uh, encounters somebody who is obviously mentally or homeless, that this person gets incarcerated. It costs taxpayers enormous amounts of money. Um, and uh, of course, it's terrible social outcomes. These people are often already in some kind of treatment and having the real-time data there to allow the, uh, the police officers to divert those folks to the proper kind of care instead of incarcerating them is, is an enormously helpful. They already have amazing policies in Seattle, but they need the real-time data to be able to implement those policies well. Uh, this is uh, some of our fellows um, can tell you that the kind of experiences that they have during their residency involve ride-alongs with the police, or in the case of our, yeah, our engagement with Louisville, Kentucky, being booked into jail. So these are some of our fellows actually at the police dispatch office, really learning from the ground up what it's like to do this work and how they can help in a very uh, contextualized way. We're doing work this year also in economic development, our second focus area. Um, the big new project there is with New Orleans, where 52% of African American men of working age are not working. That's despite hundreds of millions of federal dollars that flow down into this city for workforce training. 
but that workforce training isn't being applied to the things it needs to be applied to, the services are difficult to access, and that training isn't working. And we think that with service redesign, we can help make those dollars bent to actually get people into the training they need to get jobs that will actually pay the rent. Um, we're working in Long Beach, uh, essentially on the Startup in a Day initiative. How do we streamline the process of permitting uh, for small, new small businesses? Um, and then a lot of our work right now, probably our most mature area, is what we call healthy communities. Uh, in New York, uh, you, we are working to help case workers essentially use data across the many, many departments and many, many services that New York City has to support people um, to actually access that uh, data better in an appropriate, safe way so that everybody who encounters people in the system in New York City can do their jobs better and get better outcomes. I would love to talk more about this, but I think the, there are people here who are much more qualified to do so, including Matt Klein, Ariel Kennan, Amulia, Charlie, and Keith, um, who I think are, uh, probably checked you in when you came here today. So please talk to them about this project. It's amazing, and I wouldn't do it justice by diving into it now. Um, as part of their research, by the way, if you want to understand what these um, fellows are doing, Part of what they did is uh, went out with the social workers uh, and the police department when we had a code blue, which is the temperature dropping below 32, uh, and actually ask folks who are in the subways to please come in. Can you come into a shelter and see how that process works and see how the interventions could be made more effective? Um, and then also in health this year, we're in Kansas City, where the process of uh, immunization records for kids is messed up in a lot of ways, or let's say suboptimal, and we're just helping them make that a lot easier so that we know which kids are immunized and that, um, the parents don't have to wait in line all day at the beginning of the school year every year. I want to talk about a couple of other projects really quickly. I'm at six minutes. I'm going to get do it in 10, I promise. Um, that didn't happen through our fellowship, or at least started through our fellowship, um, because this was a big deal for us at the end of the year. Um, we'd been asked to come in to the state of California and work on the food stamps program. We'd been doing it through our fellowship since 2013. Um, and as part of that work, we were asked to look at an RFP for the child welfare system. So there's 475,000 reported cases of abuse and neglect in the state of California every year. And the software that social workers use has been out of federal compliance for many years. They have been trying to do a very large RFP a couple of times. They spend years gathering requirements for this. It's seven modules done all at once over the course of five to six years, or at least that's the initial estimate. They believed it would be about uh, 500 uh, million to a billion dollars. It would go to a large system integrator. And they asked us to give our opinion on whether we thought that that would work. As Noel mentioned, I happen to work in the White House during healthcare.gov. And when we looked at this, <laughs> we said, yeah, this is healthcare.gov, but probably worse. It had all of the hallmarks of a failed IT project. In the federal government, we know that about 94% of large IT projects fail. Luckily, I think we were able to make the case that this is a system that morally should not fail. <laughs> um, so we worked with this team there over the course of um, really eight weeks to completely throw out the large monolithic waterfall um, procurement. It looked like the, uh, and now it looks like this. Instead of all seven modules all at once, we've broken it up into its seven bits. The first bid that goes out is just for an API to wrap around the mainframe. The second bit is for uh, case management. Um, and uh, this RFP, though I'm sure it's not perfect in many ways, is an enormous leap forward for government software that works. It requires open source and under, an open standards. Commodity open source components and tools where, when they're available. New source code will be made open and reusable and published with an appropriate license. The, the thing actually, if, if people here are Pivotal Tracker fans, the RFP actually requires Pivotal Tracker. And most importantly, it requires not 
thousands of pages of requirements developed in-house only over the course of three or four years. It requires a true understanding of user needs and the ability to iterate on that in an agile way over the course of the project. We think this has an enormously better chance of actually working, and more importantly, we'll know if it's working in a year, not in five years, when social workers are still having to deal with software that doesn't work. So I, one ask I would have of all of you here is that any place we can run this play on a large IT project where you can advocate that, we would be absolutely help, happy to help get in there and advocate and just show the documents. This does work. This is how um, projects at the local level are happening today. It's how the AT AT&F and USDS do their projects. Please tell everybody in government you know that this playbook works and we, can't, we do have another model and we should be using it. I have to give enormous credit to the folks at the state of California who just courageously stepped up and said, sure, there's only eight weeks left before we have to put the RFP up, but we're gonna do this. And to the vendors who showed up for this radically different, um, radically different uh, kind of approach. Um, this work came out of our work on food stamps, and I'll just briefly show you. This is how people apply for food stamps in California right now. It's 50 screens long. There's several hundred questions. One of them is, have you or any member of your family been convicted of trading food stamp, food benefits for guns, ammunition, or drugs since April 20th, 1996? I wouldn't want to answer that question. I think you probably wouldn't either. It keeps going, but just I'll, I'll spare you the torture. This is how a Code for America team has rebuilt this application to work on mobile um, at, or tablets so we can take it out into the field and row people in food stamps on the street. And it's just six quick questions and you're done. Thank you. And we follow up with everybody who we've applied for via text message, and we have data about the barriers to enrollment beyond application about every client that we have, and we play that data back to the counties in California to help them improve their operations. So I will just end by saying I'm so excited to be here. You all know this, but nobody's got an excuse not to be working with government at this point. If you've got an hour, go to the Civic Tech Issue Finder on codeforamerica.org. If you've got a day, you know, well, hey, guess what? You're here today. There we go. Uh, if you've got a night a week, make sure you're part of your brigade. If you're ready to give a year to government service, um, there's the Code for America Fellowship, there's the Presidential Innovation Fellows Program, Civic Halls Lab Program, or most importantly, please, more people go work in government. Thank you so much. Sorry, it was 11.